Welcome to Five Strike Weekly, everyone. This week, we take a look back at another incredibly frustrating home performance against the Seattle Sounders, and we preview that big match against DC United with the return of Emil Assad and Wayne Rooney. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the Notification Squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button. So guys, let's get into that hella annoying match against Seattle Sounders at the Benz. It was a 1-1 draw and, you know, we, we came back early in the second half, but, you know, ultimately we uh, didn't create many quality chances uh, and we played right into Seattle Sounders, just their game plan, which was to just, you know, uh, be just a nuisance, uh, do everything to waste time. And, uh, you know, I think it's something that uh, we need to figure out, obviously. But, man, uh, what did you think of the match, Tanner? Uh, shit housery of the <laughs> highest order from Seattle to begin with. They really didn't intend to play that game after the first five minutes. Yep. But like you said, you know, they are a defensively sound team. No pun intended. They, yep. they do well like that. They just don't score a lot of goals. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Joseph has more than they do. <laughs> but when they are successful defensively, they can get results. Fortunately, they were successful because Atlanta United basically did exactly what they wanted to do. It was just poor play again against a team that they should be beating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe at certain points in time, there was some decent play from Atlanta United. But overall, the number of clear-cut chances created was not good enough. Even the goal that Atlanta United got was not off a clear-cut chance. It was a great ball in by Julian Gressel. And Joseph Martinez somehow, as he does, outjumped two central defenders got the back of his head on the ball, and it went in because the keeper was off his line. And aside from a moment of brilliance from that, he hit the post off of a corner, which was really the only good corner delivery they had all game. And, well, I guess aside from the one that, you know, McCann got absolutely suplexed on, but we'll get to the yep. ref being terrible in VAR later. Yep. But again, it was just another disappointing performance at home against a team that they should beat. Seattle has as few points as they do because they are not a good team. Yep. Any team that comes into the bins should lose. Because you're playing at home in front of that many people with the creative talent that Atlanta United have, they should win. Right now, that's not happening. And it's not happening consistently enough. And for me, that's worrying. Yeah. I mean, so as annoying as the refs were and, you know, how inconsistent VAR is being used at the bins is, uh, it's still, you know, a case of Atlanta not being good enough, uh, you know, to really break down this really parked bus slash tires, especially when, you know, uh, when McCrary, their right back, uh, went off on uh, on the two yellows. Yeah, uh, I knew at that point it was just going to be an even tougher uh, case where they sat so deep, uh, deeper than they were already. And uh, yeah, it's just, it makes it where uh, I knew that, you know, our uh, our chances to win this match was just going to be completely null because the quality of what we were doing was not uh, up to par. I, I felt like what we were going to do again was to pump crosses um, in from wide, and it just doesn't work against a team that uh, really crowds the middle. Yeah, I mean, because you have to think, at the end of the day, crossing is what teams do when they can't do anything else. You yeah. put it in the box and hope someone gets ahead to it. That's what you do when you run out of ideas. Mm -hmm. And watching it landing out of play over the last two to three months at home, that's what I feel like I'm watching, is a complete lack of ideas after they can't figure out how to get through a team. And most of the time, it's just stale possession that gets passed side to side. Players take one, two, three, four touches, decide to play a ball out wide, maybe it gets recycled all the way back around to the other side, and eventually a cross gets put in. A lot of the times, it's a place where a cross could be decent, but the delivery is lacking. Or, as the case was in a lot of you know chances on uh, Sunday, it was a decent cross, but there was only one person in the box, and it's a five foot seven Joseph Martinez who's being marked by two to three people. People rarely make the run to the back post or even try to make a run to the front post. A lot of the time, the only person in the box is Joseph Martinez. If you want to beat teams, you have to put at least multiple people in the box to have a chance to win these headers. That's not happening right now. Players have to play the ball quickly when teams sit deep. When you move the ball one, two touch passing and make it quick, that's what moves the defenders around and doesn't give them a chance to settle back into their shape. Right. Atlanta had to move the ball way too slow against Seattle. And for a team that's disciplined defensively, they sat, they kept their shape, and there was no way in for United. 
United have to figure this out. Tata talked about it after the game yep. as well. Mm -hmm. Players weren't, you know, there weren't people getting into the box, yep. making these attacking runs, making, you know, getting this opportunity to create chances. We spoke last week about how, you know, is Joseph, are we over-reliant on Joseph Martinez to score goals? We both said no. I still just, I still think, no, we're not over-reliant on Joseph Martinez. But other players have to put themselves in a position to score goals because if they do that, it'll make it easier for Joseph to get even more. Yeah. But right or now, even that's pop off a shot. I yeah. mean, or even you know, shoot. So, the shooting is a nice start. Yeah, and so, you know, uh, we, we our, our best chances uh, kind of fell to uh, Miggy, who fluffed his lines there. Uh, McCann, who uh, was not even able to get a shot off, uh, stuff like that, where, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe with guys that are able to dribble into the box, they should have and just pop off a shot, you know, either from distance or in the box where it's a quality chance. Yeah, like, uh, you know, but we just didn't have that this game where, you know, uh, Barco, very hesitant to shoot, pretty much. Uh, since, uh, I mean, almost since like preseason, I would say, uh, when he, you know, put it, you know, Thierry Henry asking to the, the right Which corner. Which is odd, because when yeah. he shoots, he does well. I mean, his yeah. goals against Chicago, his goal against Orlando, both of them well exactly. taken. I mean, yeah. he had a couple opportunities, especially in the second half, mm -hmm. where space opened up for him at the top of the 18. And right. as he tends to do this season, he is a young player. He will get better. It's just frustrating now. Right. He takes that extra two, three right. touches and then, you know, dribbles himself into trouble. Right. But he did create the most chances, uh, whether they were quality chances is a whole other thing. But he created five chances in this match and it was more than anybody else. Um, so, you know, he is a guy who is, um, you know, getting some of that uh, the quality that we need in there. It's just a matter of if our guys are in quality attacking positions and Tito didn't have his best match either no. um, and you know expecting when you know you want all the uh, your, your four four horsemen in front like uh, you know when you have all of Joseph Miggy Tito and Barco you know you expect a lot more than this um, and that's kind of what is upsetting about a match like this you you know you think that um, the way we've uh, been lacking a person like Tito, like he could affect this game more, and it really wasn't the case. I think something right now that's clearly lacking from this team is just a sense of ruthlessness. Sure. The only player who has that is Joseph. He's mm -hmm. the only one that, if he gets a half chance, he'll do something with it. Right. But the rest of the team lacks that. You know, the best chance to create in that entire game, in my opinion, was the one that fell to Almiron. It was a great bit of play he has to bury that. I yeah. expect him to bury yeah. that. If he wants to be playing in Europe, get on goal. he has to at least put it on frame and make the keeper make a save. If you hit it from that close, highly unlikely he's gonna catch it. Poor. But you know, it, it was just, again, it just ended up being a, the same old, same old, you know? Yeah. And and I think for me right now, and, and you know, Tata finally, you know, did make a comment about it. So you know that he's at least gonna take it to the, the tactics room and try to figure out something different. Right. And you know, they have to kind of change something because whatever they're doing right now, it mm -hmm. just it just isn't working. And right. they're dropping results and drawing games and playing poorly at home, which is really frustrating. Especially, you know, yeah. when they open up the whole stadium, yeah. record's not that great. Three draws. So Yeah, no, it is it's kind of true, I guess maybe, you know, uh Seattle Sounders, they're not uh, you know, uh it's not unknown to them to play uh, uh you know, to a really large crowd. Obviously they are uh, before us, they preceded us with very large crowds that you know we aspire to as as fans. Absolutely. And uh, so they kind of set the bar, but we kind of really you know surpassed that. But I think some fans are getting a little you know kind of laissez faire about our uh, you know our, our record attendances. Like, it doesn't really mean much to them. I think they want the they want the uh, the results, you know, and I don't blame them, but to a degree, there are some of the fans that, uh, you know, they're threatening that uh, they're not going to renew their season ticket holder or their, their season tickets, and it's like, you know, there are so many people in line, they really, yeah, yeah it's not going to affect their bottom line at all. For me, so. it's it's not it's <laughs> not one of those, you know, the results are going to make me give up my season ticket. Exactly. That's not going to be the issue. I think the yeah. funny thing is for me this week is the same week that everyone's season tickets go up again, mm -hmm. you deliver a rather lackluster performance when you open up the whole stadium. That's kind of frustrating, but the idea that, oh, we're not playing great at home, I'm going to throw it in the bin is a bit ridiculous. Yeah. My only issue is if it keeps going up, then I'll have a problem. But, you know, when it comes to performance, that's sports. 
your team isn't going to win all the time. Yeah. It's just really frustrating. Yeah. Deal with it. That's what makes that moment when you win mm -hmm. so much better. For sure. We have super high expectations. We both of us had big wins predicted for this weekend, and it didn't happen. Sports. I thought that Atlanta is, you know, was a favorite to win the MLS Cup. Right now, kind of second guessing myself a little bit, but that's sports. Mm -hmm. So as frustrating as it is right now, take the positives. You know, Atlanta playing really well on the road. When teams actually have to play the game of football, Atlanta usually wins. Mm -hmm. They will get it figured out. They have a world-class manager and the best squad in the entirety of MLS that's getting better with the signing of Eric Rometty and we'll probably see him this weekend. Yep. It's gonna be okay. Yeah. It's just frustrating right now. It's driving me insane because we're not winning the games I think we should. We're not scoring the goals that I seen us score and that I think we should score. But you know, you gotta trust it and hope that they're gonna get it figured out. And again, I think they will. It's just right now they haven't. Yeah, and back to the the season ticket holder thing. I mean, you know, so people that are uh, you know worried about. Uh, the extra, the, the peripheral things about this. I think it's this, man. Back your team. You know, if you have decided Atlanta United is your team, stick with your team. And, you know, uh, I think it's a team that, and it's a club structure that have done everything right. The, uh, you know, getting, like raising these ticket prices, it's more about getting it to the resale values that, Unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of self-inflicted. I mean, yeah. uh, when the, the demand's so high, the prices are going to be there. Exactly. I think if we're going to just talk about this for a little bit, and honestly, I think we should because yeah. we saw a lot of fans express their opinions about this this past week on social media, yeah. and, I, and I agree. I, I'm not a fan of ticket prices going up, especially, and I don't mean this in a bad way, when the product on the field isn't equal to, say, what you're getting in Europe, where you're seeing the best players in the world play, there you can justify the ticket prices being 700 to 1,000 pounds for a season ticket, which is around $1,000. For MLS, I'm not necessarily comfortable paying that because while it might be fun, I'm not paying to watch Cristiano Ronaldo or Paul Pogba or these great players. And also, it's not on the same level as the NFL. So I don't want my ticket to keep going up to the point where it'll be difficult to afford, especially for founding members, especially for supporter section, for the people where you want this noise coming from. Mm -hmm. This club is founded as a family club. That's the image they've projected. And it's gonna be difficult for a family of four, for instance, if yep. their season ticket prices go up, you know, $100, $1,500 mm -hmm. every season, eventually you can't have that family at the game anymore. And that's the only problem I have with it is potentially sure. you alienate the people who've been there from the beginning because yeah. when they got there, they could afford it. Mm -hmm. Maybe for people coming in later, you can keep raising mm -hmm. those rates. But also I think something that needs to be noted is a lot of these tickets and these resales, people are never going to the game. They just buy it and sell the ticket. Yep. So you can do things that other clubs do is, you have to go to X amount of games. You personally, right. you can't transfer it, you can't sell it, you have to go to those games. And you've, we've kind of heard that on social media that some people are uh, having their season ticket, uh, their, that whole thing revoked because they are selling it too much, they're not going to enough games. Um, and there is a little bit of, uh, well, it's a double-edged sword because some people maybe live far away and mm. their whole plan was to not really be able to uh, you know, go to a lot of games anyway. So. You know, if that's the case, so my thing line, is like, if you're not planning to go to a lot of games, then buy the occasional ticket. Don't sell it for a profit. I agree, I agree. That that's my issue with that. Yeah. Or it's like sell at face value. Yeah, you know? or like, or, so, or transfer it. Give it to a friend, to yeah. a family, or maybe they can pay you not through Ticketmaster, who yeah. I never want to give money to because they're frustrating. But like sure. transferring a ticket or giving it to a friend or a family so they can go see the game is different than yeah. having it maybe go to two or three and you sell the rest to make a profit off your season ticket. Yeah. That is a season ticket holder pisses me yeah. off because then you're using it for money and not as much because you're a fan. Yep. I want fans first, money right. second. And, and that's that, my only issue. And that, that's where it might price out some of the, you know, what's really good about our fan base is that, yeah, there is a very diverse, uh, not just demographic uh, in race, but also in age. Uh, that, you know, not just the people that are, you know, a little bit elder and can afford it uh, with like club seats or whichever may have you if you're even a little bit more uh, you know well off but it's a lot of the people in the supporter section or are young adults young professionals and um, you know those guys can't afford a ridiculous up uh, up hike uh, but you know these are some of the most you know 
uh, to use our, our thing. The, some of the most rowdy people yeah. in the stadium. And Supporter so, section especially. Like, yeah. That's the one for me that you can't really touch because, yeah. the, you know, Atlanta has come out and said they want the supporter section to be like the Geldevon for Borussia Dortmund. They sure. want a whole wall of noise. Oh. Mm -hmm. Those pri those ticket prices are reasonable for those fans because mm -hmm. they know that's where the noise comes from. Right. That's where the atmosphere comes from. Mm -hmm. If the price keeps going up, you price out a lot of those people who are usually lower on the income scale than sure. what you get for the rest of people. I don't want the supporter section to become an elitist place where only the people that can have money can go there right. because also it's GA. Also, there's yep. issues there. You get covered in beer, obstructed views. I don't sure. care. At the end of the day, I love it because that's where the atmosphere is. Right. And if you keep raising the prices on those tickets, especially, that's what will really piss me yeah, off. Yeah, it, it'll become more uh, more like a library. Like it'll a become lot of, more like a, you, you know, know what? I'm a Manchester United fan. Yeah. I'll say it. Having been to Old Trafford, it gets really quiet sometimes yeah. because tickets are expensive. You can't stand. And the people that want to make the noise, sometimes yeah. you just can't. Yeah. So, you know, I'm taking a shot at the club that, you know, came first for me that I love. Sure. Unless it's a big European night, it can get quiet at Old Trafford, which yeah. is, you know, one of the biggest and most important stadiums in the world. Yeah. I don't want that here. Yeah. I, I think you're also dealing with uh, more and more casuals coming in uh, and that, uh, you know, maybe they're less knowledgeable, they don't know the chance, uh, and they're less, they're, they're more reluctant to actually jump in and uh, be participant. And, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's all a chicken and egg situation. Yeah. Obviously, they, it's, at the end of the day, you know, uh, Atlanta United, the club is a business, and so they are doing what's in their best interest. And so, um, you know, I think we can all, as a fan base, uh, you know, clap back a little bit. But I think you know we have to realize that there's a little bit of this give and take. So, uh, but moving on to other parts of the match, uh, you know, uh, there was definitely a really, really great tifo. This time, oh, yeah. um, brilliant, great yeah. work on everyone who organized yeah. that. By the way, yeah. I, the I don't know standard. the specific, but that was yeah. it fantastic. Was, uh, Resurgence was uh, one of the main proprietors, the uh, the supporters group that um, you know was really the the main cog uh, with the other supporters groups, um, really kind of supporting it and uh, you know making it as great as it was. Yeah, this uh, this coordination was fantastic throughout the entire supporter section this time and. Uh, a fantastic idea with uh, the gold standard. Yeah, it's uh, really difficult to pull yeah, that off as well. Sure. And they yeah. did a great job. And you know, once again, one of those things where it's like, t people around the world will see the video of that and go, yeah. they're excited about what they're doing. And mm -hmm. you know, that's it's just again, just an incredible thing. And I, I was I was shocked when I got there to see what was going on. And it was I wish I could have seen it from outside, but yeah. being a part of it was just an absolute blast. And mm -hmm. The way that they, you know, they had these leaders and the supporters groups coming up, going through the, the stands and explaining what was going on, mm -hmm. it was great. That's how you get the people who might be casual fans engaged. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe they can a little bit more. And obviously, the heads of those groups will know a lot more about it than I will. But getting some more of those chants, because especially outside of those core people in the bottom of the supporter section, it can be difficult for people to hear these chants and learn them just from hearing them. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, that all, we're 18 months in basically to, yeah. to this team playing football. So it's like, that's all gonna come with time, but there's a great start. And you know, as annoying as the result was, they broke another record on Sunday, man. Yeah. And that's incredible. And you know, it's just gonna keep happening. And mm -hmm. it just, I guess it'd take a moment to just say thank you to Atlanta United fans for making Atlanta United what it is right now. And you know, I know that things may be frustrating, but the fact that we have this is incredible. And a lot of people are really jealous of that, and that makes me happy. Yeah. And speaking of like really, really jealous people, uh, there was this fan in our YouTube video uh, after this fan cam from Devin that, uh, yeah, said some just ridiculous claims that, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and, you know, just things that are not really based in fact at all. You can have a look at it, you know, on screen right now. But uh, yeah, um, I just gotta say, um, you are really, really dumb. Yeah, I'm not sure how MLS is cheating in favor of Atlanta United. We're just really good at getting people green cards. They're not citizens, by the way. Um, and that's not our fault because that's how the US government works. So take it up with them if you wanna talk about getting, you know, green cards and stuff. But uh, we're really good at picking players mm -hmm. and the front office is probably the best in the league and they know what they're doing. And there's a great coach and a great stadium and great fans. So, you know, we definitely modeled a lot of things we did off Seattle. 
clearly not the whole stupid fan part when it comes yeah. to people commenting on videos like this. You didn't do a great job. However, don't worry, you're not Waste Man of the Week. That comes later. Hint, hint, also a sounder though. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so, uh, getting into some of the quotes from this week from the players and our coach. And Tata Martino said, on being more disappointed in the result or the factors that led to the result, said, I'm calm with the production of the team today. It's difficult to play against a defense that sits so far back and just plays very defensively. It's difficult to break that defense down. I thought we did it pretty well at times, especially in the second half, but it's hard to do. The only thing I would say, and it's not worrisome, but something we could work on is to have somebody other than Joseph Martinez in and around the box who's able to score goals for us. We need to try to have more guys in goal scoring positions. I mean, that just kind of reiterates what we were saying uh, earlier, but it definitely is, uh, yeah, I mean, Tito, I think lately hasn't been able to get into prime attacking positions uh, like last year. Um, and also, I mean, obviously he was playing more as a just a lone striker last year as well, but, um, you know, I think uh, him being able to poach a little bit too, he's a good kind of poaching striker that... Uh, he hasn't been able to get in those type of positions, you know? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it, and he may change it, who knows, I think a lot could be with how the team is set up. He's set up with, you know, both of the wide players to be more, you know, worked as wingers, mm -hmm. although Barco is also right-footed. For me, I, I think we, we might see him change things up a little bit at some point in time, maybe sure. move Tito over to the right-hand side, which is something I certainly would want to see, yeah. especially because I think Tito offers more in terms of mm -hmm. his aggressiveness and his desire to score goals. Yeah. Not saying that Barco doesn't have that, but right now mm -hmm. he looks a lot more like a creator than sure. a goal scorer. Mm -hmm. And maybe if Barco's on the right-hand side, it gives him that chance to use his right foot, put a mm -hmm. cross in, as opposed to Tito, who, as we know, if he cuts in on his right foot off the left, yes. that usually ends Rockets. up in the back of the net and the keeper can't save it. So uh, that, that could be something that they could explore. But, absolutely. you know... Be, or just I being mean, more fluid within the match within, as well. within the match. Yeah. I think, you know, moving around, popping up, yes. taking different positions, and, exactly. and popping up in different areas could be yeah. really useful. But, yeah. you know, they'll work on it. Yeah. I can complain and throw out my ideas as much as I want. But at the end of the day, Tata Martino has forgotten more about football than I will ever know in my entire life. And as frustrated as I'm going to be, I still trust him that he's going to get things done. Mm -hmm. He's done way too much for me not to believe otherwise. So sure. when yeah. he says that he's calm about it, I'm going to believe him. Yeah. And uh, so Jeff Lorenowitz had uh, some things to say about VAR and uh, Nicholas Lodero and all that. Uh, he said, on Seattle's stall tactic to get the VAR decision, there is a bit of gray area in my understanding of the rules. You can either purposefully deny or the ref can force you to wait. There's been times where we've wanted to play quickly and to pass, and they've stopped us to allow VAR to assess what happened. I think that's the rule. I think that the ref can slow it down. I don't know who slowed it down first. Nicholas Lodero to not take the corner or Toledo to speak with the VAR and it seemed inevitable in that first half. Something was going to happen via VAR. Yeah, I mean, uh, with the, uh, just the ball that uh, hit right into Escobar's hand, um, I think it's pretty clear cut uh, when you can actually see that it hits his right arm um, and it's a distance that he could actually, you know, pull it down in time. Um, yeah, unfortunately it is a penalty, um, you know, and then right before that, uh, LGP, uh, he, he gets one from point blank. He, it gets him, uh, kind of lower near his waist a little bit, but that's just, there's not enough time to react in that, to that sense. And it wasn't called a penalty. And I think rightfully yeah, so. Yeah, I think, I think what you've been seeing, especially but, in the World Cup, is yeah. that, you know, if, if it's down below your waist, you're yeah. usually pretty good because mm -hmm. that's a natural position. Right. Escobar's issue was his arms were up when he was jumping yeah. and, and it caught him. And, yeah. you know, as frustrating as it was that Seattle maybe took a little while or, you know, eventually got around to almost taking the corner and then, then the VR is called in. Mm -hmm. Atlanta has been guilty of that as well. Remember yep. early in the season, Jeff Lerner specifically telling Miggy not, not to, to take, take the corner. So, yep. and it happens. That, that's that's part of the gamesmanship of it. I think the issue isn't as much with the players, as annoying as it is. Yep. I think the issue is the usage of the system itself yep. and how it's implemented in MLS mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, not the right way to do it. Yep. I think that if, remember, last year's season, VR wasn't there at the beginning of the season. It came in halfway. So if they can make changes to it or implement something halfway through, mm. then just take a page out of FIFA's book and just do what they did at the Flipping World Cup because yeah. it worked for the most part. Yeah. And fans weren't going, what the hell just happened? Mm. Meanwhile, in MLS, you're like, 
I have no idea what's going on because in, in my opinion, in the first half, Joseph Martinez should not have been on the field. He should have gotten a red yeah. card yeah. for a headbutt because yeah. he was pissed and yeah. he should have been gone. But VAR didn't, well, they told him to maybe think about kind of reviewing it and then he didn't. Yeah. The referee was a wanker anyway, mm -hmm. but like VAR is so inconsistent, especially in the bins. For some reason, every game, almost every game, yeah. has a VAR decision that I'm left scratching my head about. And the other issue with VAR and MLS, it takes way too damn long. Yeah. From the time that the ball hit Escobar's hand to the time the penalty was taken was what, four or five minutes? Yeah. That is ridiculous. It should take 90 seconds max yeah. for the decision to come in. Even if it's against my team, I'd rather it just happen mm -hmm. as opposed to me standing there for four or five minutes than having that time added on and having no idea what happened or why. Yeah. For it me, is, again, it's, it's yeah. VAR. It's the, it's, it's the system itself mm -hmm. just blows my mind and it just frustrates me to no end. Yeah, no, it's the inconsistencies in, you know, how long everything takes uh, and how, you know, the, the officials aren't really they don't seem like they're uh, they're very confident in the the choices that they're making on the field, um, and you know maybe a solution is to keep it off site. Maybe uh, you know where a VAR person is strictly just a VAR. Whatever it is, there needs to be just better implementation because uh, I think you know we're not the only fans that are getting frustrated with it, but uh, you know we obviously we see it every single match at the Benz, and so that is. Very frustrating. Of yeah, I think you're on a good point there. I mean, for me, if we're gonna, if we're talking about it now, I think we may as well just talk about it because sure. it's a big talking point. And yeah. I think something you're, you're right. I think they need to take the page out of FIFA's book, and also the NFL and Major League Baseball. Just have it at your home office in New York. Mm -hmm. Have a booth of three or four guys like they had at the World Cup watching the game. They'll call the ref from there if he needs to make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's it. Having it on site clearly isn't working. I don't know if the person's influenced by watching the game, being yeah. there, but one person by themselves is not doing a very good job. You need multiple people looking at it from different angles at the same time, mm -hmm. communicating who are trained refs who can tell the referee, hey, you need to look at this. And by having that many people, they can come to that decision faster. Right. right now, my biggest issue out of everything, aside from the fact that most of the decisions, in my opinion, are inconsistent at best, yeah. is the time it takes for it to happen. Yeah. The time it takes for it to happen is absolutely numbing yeah. to my brain, and it frustrates the hell out of me. Yeah. I think the other issue that you touched on there mm -hmm. is at the World Cup, there's the best the best refs in the world, sure. by all accounts. Major League Soccer, Geiger, but yeah, sure. Not so, by, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> by all accounts, best refs in the world. Yeah. Major League Soccer. He had a decent World Cup anyway. Yeah, yeah, decent. Yeah, we'll go with that. But I mean, he he got, got selected to keep going, so clearly FIFA thought he was decent. But yeah. like Major League Soccer clearly just struggles on the re having decent referees yeah. who are paid what they should be paid because they're not. That's why they're so yeah. poor. They don't make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and they're not trained enough. And when you do that, and you throw them in front of seventy thousand people in front of a nationally televised audience, they crumble. They they crumble. <laughs> they they struggle under pressure and. Yeah. That's gonna happen to anyone. Let's not pretend that either you or me wants to put a yellow shirt on and go do that job. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't. It's an uh, it's an but unwanted they need to be job. But better. they need yeah. to be doing it right when they're there. Yeah. If they're out on the field, they should be able to make the calls in the moment and do it. Yeah. Right now, that's not happening. And right. I never thought I'd see the day, but. I would have rather had Mark Geiger calling that game than Toledo because he had no idea what the hell was going on. Yeah, and it was yeah. just absolutely infuriating sure. to watch him let Seattle continuously waste yeah. time over and over and over again. The booking for LGP in the first half absolutely pissed me off because that guy threw himself to the floor. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's this. just uh, I, I would have been okay with all of the calls actually being called. Uh, because that would have set the tone early enough to where, you know, Seattle, hey, you know, if you're going to waste that much time and if you're going to, uh, you know, argue every single call and Lodero, if you're going to try to be, you know, the... Uh, Neymar of MLS? Yeah, Neymar or, you know, just uh, the, you know, the fifth official. I mean, whatever it is, uh, whatever it is, um, it would have nipped it in the bud early and it would have change the entire match, I feel like. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the but... ref's job to control the game and make sure it keeps moving. And right yeah. now, more often than not, and it's not just Atlanta United, it's the entirety of the league, yeah. that's not happening. And yeah. it's a shame because it yeah. wastes valuable time that we could be watching playing soccer. And right. it's... It, it just it's, it's just not good. But yeah. I mean, let's just... I, I, yeah. I, I'll talk myself <laughs> blue in the face over the officials and over VAR, so right. I'll just... 
digress. Yeah, but there's uh, there's good things happening with the club, and so moving into the news, we have a new signing who has officially been introduced to the public, uh, Eric Rometty. Uh, his press conference was today, and um, you know he spoke a lot of good things about Atlanta United and him wanting to come here. How it was a almost like a no-brainer for him. He didn't think twice about the decision. Um, and that also a lot of Argentines, because you know we have a lot of Argentines on the club, and especially with Tata Martino as our head coach, uh, it's a very very attractive thing for you know players in the Argentine league as well. So uh, you know he uh, spoke just so like glowingly of us, and uh, you know I think we just have to say welcome Eric Rometty. Uh, he also gets. He gets the yeah. number 11 jersey, though, uh, yeah. which I'm sure is going to rile or maybe get into the nostalgia zone for a lot of fans because, of course, it's Yamil Assad's old number. Um, I mean, it's this, too. It's not like Yamil Assad is, like, a legendary player and he, um, you know... Has, scored goals yeah. in winning games that won yeah. his titles. He was with us for one year. I mean, there's a lot of nostalgia because he's our first goal scorer, yes. And the fact that he's just but, an amazing guy individually. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, everyone I, I he talks to is just a great person. Yeah. But, like you said, one year, and he's gone. That's yeah. the sport. And Eric yeah. Medi's here, and I think he's going to have a good career with Atlanta United because so. he's a very tenacious midfielder. Yeah. He might see red a few times, but I like I like the cut of his gym. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Agreed, agreed. But um, yeah, and so, you know, speaking of Yamil Assad uh, this week, you know, he scored a ridiculous colasso uh, in Audi Field to christen the stadium. Something um, about that, the number yeah. of goals in places yeah. for teams. Yeah, he, uh, he really has the, you know, the affinity for the moment. And, um, you know, I think uh, if he's not already going to win the MLS Goal of the Week, you know, he's I'd leading it for it. sure. Yeah, yeah. 100%. It, very, very good. Yeah, outside of the box. There are actually curler. some really tasty goals there in are. that game, in that DC yeah. game. But, uh, we'll, we'll get into that later when we preview sure. them, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm glad to see Emil doing well. I don't yeah. wish him any ill will except, you know, when he plays this coming weekend. I hope he misses every chance he yeah, gets. Absolutely. But aside from that, yeah. it's good to see him scoring a goal. For sure, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, you know, so our match this past weekend, it was, uh, you know, it was <laughs> after the World Cup, of course, Excuse me. And so, after the World Cup, of course, they were trying to angle, you know, the two biggest fan bases in MLS um, that, you know, people would watch and people, uh, uh, both of our fan bases would, you know, make this probably one of the highest rated, uh, at least um, on television, you know, uh, matches ever. And this, this match got reportedly from uh, Jonathan Tannenwald it got 1.558 million viewers. Uh, I think the World Cup was something around uh, 10 million for, for Fox. So, you know, very, very decent numbers. Of course, though, uh, I, I could, you know, I wouldn't blame any of the viewers for switching off. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, when... It was, you, for a lot of people, yeah. everything they hated about <laughs> soccer. Yeah. So, that's probably well, the most frustrating part is that... The two clubs really failed to deliver on what they were hoping to see. Right. That being said, I kind of blame a lot of that on Seattle because they didn't really try to play at any point in the game. And if I'm a fan of Seattle, I wouldn't really be happy if that's how you're setting up every game. But yep. that's not the point. Yep. The point is, a lot of people watched, and that's good for the league. And hopefully those numbers continue to grow all across the league so that the league continue to grow. And, you know, everything will just keep getting better. And I think that's the direction you see the league going with teams right. like Atlanta United, teams like Seattle, mm -hmm. LAFC. You know, Miami, so they want to model the same thing that Atlanta has done. That's what True. you need to continue growing the league and continue to get these fan bases engaged and bring new viewers in. That's what we want to see. So on that note, mm -hmm. it's good to see that many people watching soccer in America. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, and so this uh, this may come as a damper for some people, but uh, you know, it is what it is. I don't think many of us uh, really, really thought that Cristiano Ronaldo was going to come to the All-Star game, but uh, it has been reported that uh, by Juventus and AS, uh, the, uh, the the outlet, that he is probably not going to show up. So, it, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a shocker, I think, really. I mean, it's just, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, playing in the World Cup and then the recovery time and... 
uh, at the earliest, <laughs> yeah, at the earliest is July 30th that he was actually going to be able to start training with Juventus. Um, that puts it too close of a timeline to August 1st of the, um, you know, yeah, I, I think it's just, yeah, it, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, it's a shame, but I mean, at the yeah. same time, it's like, you're Juventus, you really know what you got with yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo. Does he really need to play in an no. MLS All-Star game friendly? Yeah. No. It's kind of a bummer because I would have loved to see him play again. Sure. I became a fan of him when he was playing for Manchester United and I love the guy. But I'm actually, I'm really just interested to see even just play because they're yep. a fantastic team. They've won the Scudetto seven times in a row. Yep. That's the Italian championship in Serie A. Mm -hmm. And they're a really good team who I think is going to be pushing for the Champions League next year. So, Italy didn't make the World Cup. So a lot of their players are Italian. So you'll get to see a lot of guys that you might see playing for the Champions League final next year. So, yep. you know, with him or without him, I'm still excited to see Juventus play. It's still going to be a great occasion. Still one of the biggest clubs. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's going to be, it's just going to be a great time. But, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Ronaldo, you know, to get off from Milan. I'm looking forward to see him play for Juventus this year because mm -hmm. even at 33, I still think he's got some in the tank. Yeah, no, he's, he's probably got, uh, you know, elite years, probably two to three more elite yeah, that years. Yeah, so. I think that fourth year Juventus might be going, we are paying a lot for yeah. a very old individual. But they will take the If they Champions get a Champions League, League at any yeah. point in time, worth it. Yeah, I think uh, it's absolutely worth the money. Uh, I, I don't blame them. But, I still can't believe it happened, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, it happened I, so quickly. I, it happened so quickly. It was just like, you know, who we might go to? Manchester United. And I'm like, I don't want him back because he's kind of old now. He costs way too much money. PSG, yeah. they have Neymar. And then she's like, oh, he's going to Juventus. Huh? Actually, he is going to Juventus. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, because usually those rumors <laughs> kind of dwell for a while. but this Especially one, with this him. Point, like, those yeah. long names, usually yeah. it's like a whole summer yeah. thing. And then it's yeah. like, it's he's out of posturing the... for a higher salary and all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, he I says after the Champions League final this year, hey, I might not want to be here. And everyone's like, oh, uh, he just wants more money. And then it's like, bish, bash, bosh, boom, he's playing for Juventus. Yeah. Who knew? Crazy stuff. But uh, some people that are, are a couple of guys, uh, part of our, our homegrown squad, uh, that will be part of the uh, All-Star Game festivities are Andrew Carlton and Lagos Kunga, who, uh, congrats to them, they will be part of the 2018 homegrown squad who will play, uh, you know, versus a Mexican team. So, you know, great, uh, good stuff. Uh, they will be playing at the Atlanta United Training Ground. So, uh, you know, that'll be fun. And if you can, you know, make it out there, I think you'll see a lot of the, you know, emerging talent, uh, that uh, is going to be very, very exciting. So um, that's great to see. But uh, moving on, and uh, you know, we have uh, our boy Archie Eversole. He actually released his uh, United We Conquer song that you saw in that Orlando City uh, All Access video that uh, Atlanta United put out. And um, yeah, it's available for download now. So you know, I thought it was a dope track, and uh, you know, I think an actual uh, good song that's actually related to Atlanta United, so thank God. But, and moving on to Atlanta United 2, they played Bethlehem Steel and they won 2-1, and I know you guys that are naysayers uh, are, you know, are amazed that they actually uh, did something. I think they also played with more uh, kind of first team, uh, kind of at least fringe players, bench players, and so uh, it was definitely one of our strongest squads that we had in a while. But we also saw the uh, the debut of Sal Zizo at Atlanta United 2. Uh, we we saw Oliver Shannon score a screamer, uh, his first professional goal. So congrats to that boy. And uh, Brandon Vasquez scored his second of the season. So uh, all in all, a uh, you know an encouraging um, Atlanta United 2 game. And you know I think they needed that after a string of kind of not the best results, but. Uh, again, not a results-driven, um, you know, type of team for us, so uh, it is what it is. But moving on into the standings, you know, we're uh, we're kind of uh, just very shakily still at the top of the Eastern Where we've Conference. been for the, like the last few weeks, we're in yeah. first, kind but, of, but... Yes. Yeah, so NYC FC are hot on our heels. Uh, they're one point behind us, and uh, you know there's a bunch of teams that have some games in hand on us, um, and it is what it is. Um, you know I don't think we're. It's kind of fool's gold, and we're we're not actually uh, you know playing our best, nor uh, should we probably be top if uh, they played all, everybody played all the games. But I think uh, you know it is what we it is still like we're still top. So uh, until yeah, I mean, we play those games. It. 
Yeah. You know, it's uh, they, they are still uh, you know behind us in the standings. But um, yeah, in the in the support shield, it's also getting tight as well. I mean, uh, FC <laughs> Dallas, uh, you know, they look very very strong and dangerous uh, as a contender to uh, overtake that, and also Red Bulls. Uh, you know, whenever they get all their games played. So yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, at the end of the day, when you look at the points, so Atlanta are forty one through twenty one games. They're going to have more points than they had last season. Yeah. They're going to get over 60 points. It's going to be a really strong regular season, even though at yeah. times they've been incredibly frustrating to watch. I think that they might be drawing a bit too many games right now for my liking, but I mean, again, they're still in first place for now, and mm -hmm. you have teams around them that, yeah, they still have to play those games in hand. And just right. because you have games in hand doesn't mean those points are automatically going to go on the board. Yeah. So who knows what can happen there. But like you said, you know, you got to be there or thereabouts. And right now, Atlanta are in a position to get that first round by, mm -hmm. get that home seed to where they're playing at least the conference semifinals, that second leg at home, which right now might not be the best thing, but who knows? But but they're they're still there, and that's the important thing. The point they're getting points, so it's not like they're they're not getting any results mm -hmm. like you know teams in Florida, but. It's frustrating, but at the end of the day, like I said, we're still in yep. the first right now. And it could make for a very exciting, um, you know, Running. supporter shield, yeah. uh, you know, end of the season where, yeah, maybe a bunch of teams are going to maybe break the uh, the Toronto FC, you know, points total record, and then still, uh, you know, it might still be a battle. So it, it could be very, very interesting. Honestly, I don't know, uh, having not honestly been an MLS fan for a super long period of time, I can deny that. You know, Atlanta really got me into the league because it gave me something to watch in person. I don't know the last time there was a supporter shield race that was probably five, six teams going down to the wire, but that's what it looks like. But also the thing is, when you look at these teams' points totals, they're a lot better than they usually are. And sure. what that means is the quality it's of the scary. league, yeah. the quality of the league is getting better. Yeah. So these teams that are good, that are pushing Atlanta United right now, they're pushing each other. Yeah. And when you have teams that are putting those point totals up, trying to break records, trying to improve, getting more and more points, that's good for the league as a whole. Yeah. And you know, even though I'd like to see Atlanta obviously win those games, mm -hmm. it's nice when the league as a whole is improving. Sure. Because when the league as a whole improves, so Atlanta United, right. and that's what we all want to see is you know MLS making that push to be one of those top teams in you know top leagues in the world, yep. and you know they're not going to get there you know in the next five, 10, 15 years, but they're making that progress. They're moving away from that old MLS model that we saw, yep. and for me as just a pure soccer fan, mm -hmm. that's a positive. Right. So uh, moving on into our mailbag section, uh, so you know we ask you guys on Instagram. Uh, to ask us some questions about the Atlanta versus Seattle game and you guys came with a barrage of questions so uh, keep that coming for next time we ask questions there and uh, you know on our various social media as well on Twitter on Facebook etc etc but uh, our first question comes from brad t9314 he asks ain't the number of draws getting a little bit too much? Yeah, I agree with you on that. We've just kind of touched on that. I would agree. I think that they're drawing too many games, especially games at home where they should be winning. But at the end of the day, you know, they're still picking up points, especially on the road. And you can't really be upset when they draw, you know, on the road. But when you draw at home against bottom of the table teams like Seattle, it gets really annoying. But, you know, that's that's football for you. You're not going to beat every team. And especially in MLS, most of the time you don't have teams winning more than 55, 60% of their games. So, yeah. It is what it is. Yep. Uh, next one comes from uh, Dash Twenty One Bay, I think. I don't know how to really pronounce that one, but uh, uh, he asks, uh, should VAR be reformed and improved? If so, what do you think should happen? I think we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, maybe centralized VAR. Uh, Limit the scope person. of it. I think what yeah. what what um definitely scale it the, down. the World Cup did is they definitely took it away from those kind of judgment calls. Right. So to give an example, where Joseph had that goal call back earlier this year, where that's mm. more of a judgment call right. than it is a black and white call. Mm. I think getting rid of that 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 shouldn't be part of VAR. It should be you know red, not red, offside, not offside, handball, not a handball, stuff right. like that. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple, keep it clear cut, and probably move it off site and have a team as opposed to just one guy in the VAR booth. Right. I think those are improvements that yeah. can be implemented as quickly as, you know, next month because, mm -hmm. you know, the league has shown that it's willing to change things. Right. Next one comes from Demarion20. He asks, and apologies for butchering your name if, uh, if that's not it, uh, do you think Almiron didn't play as well as he has performed in past games? 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I didn't think he had his best game. I mean, yeah, that was... glaring miss is obviously mm-hmm. going to be the one that kind of sticks out. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I didn't think necessarily the whole team had their best game. Yeah. They didn't really get the opportunity to play the way they like. That's mm-hmm. a credit to Seattle for being very, very defensive and mm-hmm. very organized. And if I have to pay Seattle one compliment at all, it's the fact that they were incredibly organized at the back. So you right. have to give them credit for that. And you know, Almiron didn't get the space he usually gets to operate. And yeah. when you don't really, can, you can't really get into a flow, which Seattle managed to knock you land it out of, yeah. it's hard for a player like that to really make an impact on the game. So yeah. I'd say, yeah, he didn't maybe have his greatest game, but I expect him to bounce back next week against DC. Yeah, and uh, so next one comes from Nichols at night. Uh, he asks, do you think moving around the attacking mids would help the creativity like moving Barco to 10? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, we talked about it a little bit earlier where uh, if even just in game where they were more fluid, um, I would say even I would posit that uh, maybe uh, Miggy drops to an eight, Gressel moves over to the right, Tito moves over to the left, Barco to the ten, where they're just uh, but they communicate to each other that they're going to do it a little bit. Maybe it might uh, confuse the defense enough uh, just for a period of time in the game that. You know, it could really uh, help us score a goal that we really need. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that it's the Dallas game, if anything, showed that Atlanta United makes a tactical shift teams don't expect. I am a massive proponent of 4-3-3. I fell in love with it watching Man United play it, so come at me for that. Whatever. I love 4-3-3. I think it's a great balance system. I would posit that we should play that because when we played it, teams had no idea what to do. But I think a, ta- a tactical shift of some form would probably be really good for Atlanta United right now. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean 3-5-2. I never want to do that again for a while. But I think that they could do something moving around players, like you said. Yeah. Maybe put Almar on the right, Tito on the left. I love the idea of inverted wingers, especially when they come on to their stronger foot and can shoot. Mm-hmm. That would give you know Tito the opportunity to shoot with his right foot a lot yep. more, and then give Miggy the opportunity to shoot with his left foot even more. Mm-hmm. But also, you're right. I mean, if you drop Miggy into that eight, whether you want to do it as a midfield two or a midfield yep. three, he shows you he yeah, can do that, that work. Recovery, he yeah, covers the ground, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. So. And it would honestly, I, I love the idea of playing in midfield three with Gressel, Lorenowitz, and Miggy because I think you get a lot from both those guys. And then I'd put Barco on the right, Tito on the left. I think you get a whole lot from that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think that that's a good point. I think that there, I think there needs to be a tactical shift of some kind. And Tata Martinez, a genius, he'll figure it out. He'll come up with something. And mm-hmm. I expect Atlanta will come out and, and they'll figure it out. As frustrating as it is, mm-hmm. that guy's a genius, speaking of Tata Martino. He'll sort something out. He has enough film. He's watched enough football to know this is what I need to do to break these teams down. Yeah. It's frustrating right now, but he'll figure it out. Whatever that tactical shift will be, we'll see. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just a few more. Um, so, Alberto R. 2018. He asks, "What do you think Barco should do to be more involved with the team?" I mean, I think he's very involved already. He, uh, you know, he created the most chances this past match. Now, in terms of uh, being incisive, being uh, a person that is going to, you know, uh, be so dangerous in the box that the defense doesn't know what you're going to do. Are you going to pass? Or are you going to shoot? I think that's really how he can be a little bit more of uh, maybe a dominant force in the team. Um, because I think right now, you know, he's maybe being a little, just a little bit more passive than he needs to be. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, you know, we have to remember, Barco is 19 years old. He's a yeah. very young player. Still developing. Um, he's still developing, and it's not like he's killing Mbappe. So yeah. don't try to compare him to that. You have one that's incredible, and you have one that you see the potential that is there. Right. He scored some goals that are really incredible, mm-hmm. especially for a 19-year-old playing in Major League Soccer. You know, he will develop. Right now, my biggest issue with him is mm-hmm. he takes too many touches. I think that kind of comes at being passive. He, he might not be aggressive enough to take that shot or try to play that killer ball. Yeah. He dribbles himself into trouble sometimes. But this is all stuff that comes with playing more, mm-hmm. playing with your teammates, and learning and improving. And I think that, you know, Barker will continue to improve. And I think mm-hmm. you'll see the best of him towards the end of the season and then going into the next season. Mm-hmm. I have high hopes for the guy. I've seen the potential that this guy's had. He right. showed it. He'll continue to get better, and that's only going to come with time. Uh, next one comes from NSW. He asks, are the refs in MLS all funded and paid by Mark Geiger, the all-time greatest? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't think Mark Geiger has enough money. He does not get paid enough. Yeah, Spoiler alert, the refs do, do not get paid enough. And also, I mean, uh, for him to like want to fund and do uh, this, yeah, I mean, I, I get what joke. you're saying, man, it's, but it's yeah, funny. it's fun. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's, next it's one, good. yeah. Props. Uh, so next one comes from uh, I am Alicia D. 
if Barco and Nagby were brought on to break through the bus, why do you think we still struggle so much against the new plan? Yeah, uh, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit uh, in this episode, but um, yeah, I think one of the major parts is that while well, Nagby is not, uh, you know, currently he's, fit. Yeah, he's uh, he's been a little. He's, he's important injured. for breaking that bus down. Absolutely, for sure. He's yeah. a key player. We that missed him you, on Sunday. I, I would 100% agree yeah. with you on that. I think he was sorely missed on Sunday because yeah. his ability to be on the ball to dictate play, right. especially when teams are bunkered and you need someone who can sit in the middle, move the ball around quickly. That's what he does. You right. can also play that killer ball, which he can do. Mm-hmm. We will miss him until he gets back. Mm -hmm. But while he's gone, there's still the talent there to break down these buses. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll... It It just takes... It just takes Yeah, it takes more creativity as well. Um, You know, we need to create better quality chances like we've uh, reiterated. Move the ball quicker. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of stuff. But again, I I trust in the team that they'll figure it out. They're way too talented to not figure it out. And eventually teams are going to come here and park the bus and it's going to get absolutely smashed to bits. And they're going to have to come up with a new strategy. And when that does, well, it'll probably take him a while to figure out how to stop it. Yeah. Uh, and so last one comes from, uh, well, two people that have fairly uh, similar uh, similar questions here, but AK Leon and uh, Joseph Samuel, they pretty much ask, why do the refs suck? And, uh, well, I think it comes down to, yeah. They're underpaid, yeah, undertrained, yeah. and uh, I don't think they know the game very well. You know, they're just not very good. I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you because no. I watch these games and half the time I'm going. It's, it, yeah, just, they don't put themselves in the best positions to make the call, especially for, like, the McCann headlock from uh, the Seattle player. It's a, it's a very big case of essentially they're way too far to even be able to see what's even happening. Um, and also, that's a failure so, on VAR, by the way, because yeah, the guy is probably watching work. the game and maybe not watching all these screens where if you have four or five screens at different angles, yep. someone's going to catch the fact that a player just got freaking suplexed on a corner and yep. you can't do that. Yeah, I think it's a, you know either that or it's like a sleeper hold, uh, which something from about the Cascadia teams. They, yeah, it happened they to really, really yeah, they, just love a good headlock. I don't know if it's like a brotherly love thing or something, but yeah. you can't do it in football. Yeah. Stop. It. Exactly. But yes, I agree with you. The refs, they just suck. I don't know. I just yeah. want them to get better. At least better when they're here. Right. Because right now, it's just frustrating to yeah. just watch them continually just... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of frustrating things, uh, let, that gets us into our waste oh, yeah. of the That's week. That's going to bring us right into our favorite segment that we haven't had in a while. Um, This guy, his name's Brian Schmetzer. He happens to be the manager slash head coach of Seattle Sounders. But you wouldn't know it by the way he speaks. You wouldn't know it by the way he speaks because he speaks like a punter, like one of us who just, you know, has an opinion on a team. He took some shots at Atlanta United, mostly because he took some shots on social media, which he deserved because the way he set his team up was an absolute disgrace. And when you hear his comments, you realize they're also a disgrace. After the game, he had this to say. They pay the ticket price. They can say what they want. Twitter, you can hide behind things a lot easier than face to face. What I would say is, they're a good franchise, they've done a lot of good things, and they should be happy to cheer their team on. Throwing shade on opponents, sometimes you can cross a line. I don't think anything was malintended. There's a good competition between franchises. He goes on to also say, actually won some trophies in our first year. They did not. They certainly raised the attendance level league-wise, which is great, great story, but they beat the attendance record because there was a couple thousand Seattle fans there. I'm just gonna pause you right there and say, <laughs> what? no there wasn't. There was a nice little section, which was actually really good to see a section of their fans travel. I love it when I see away fans. Yep. Maybe a couple hundred. Yep. Slow your roll there, big guy. Mm-hmm. Focus on the game that your team didn't try playing and not on the fact that that place was 71,000 plus strong of Atlanta United fans. Yep. We absolutely break our own records. We don't need to take anything from you when it comes to putting butts in seats. Also, you're a head coach talk like one don't just start calling out people on twitter and taking shots at them that's social media live with it especially when your team doesn't really play the game they just throw themselves on the floor and waste time he's getting waste money of the week it was a really close competition between him and the ref by the way yeah. but at the end of the day when a head coach behaves in that manner says those things and has his team play that sh- <laughs> you are a bell end congratulations sir you are the waste man of the week and guys, that gets us to our match preview against 
Vaunted DC United, our bogey team. The team I yeah. actually hate. Yeah. Well, that and now Seattle Sounders, apparently. Yeah. Uh, didn't want to, but no, no, no. I've kind of been do. forced my hand on that one. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, of course, Yamil Assad, Wayne Rooney, they come into town. It's 3 30 at the Benz on Saturday. And, uh, you know, we, well, we were able to beat them at the Benz uh, for the first time uh, in our existence. In, uh, playing them 3-1, uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, you know with this form at home It's not looking the best uh, for us to play them right now uh, And so you know, they're gonna surely come in and bunker against us And so this is a very very good test uh, Although you know with Wayne Rooney in the team it may really uh, You know maybe energize them to think that they can really play against us and maybe they might open up the play but, I would agree with that. I think that, you know, DC, they're, they're a very good offensive team. And we'll get into some of the stats here, a little bit about yeah. their leaders. They're not bad at scoring goals, to be honest. And, you know, they has got a guy who's the leading goal scorer for Manchester United, who scored a lot of goals in the Premier League. And, you know, he might still have a little bit left in the tank in MLS. Who knows? We're probably going to see him make his full debut on Saturday, in my yeah. opinion. Mm -hmm. That being said, defensively, they're not the greatest. Yeah. So them being organized, they're not going to be nearly as organized as Seattle or as Portland. That's just not their forte. So I think this game could open up a little bit. But right. like you, I am very much hesitant because of our home form and because mm -hmm. they show they have the ability to score some goals. Mm -hmm. Leaves me a bit worried going into Saturday. Yeah. And, well, I mean, I think uh, they might be emboldened by some of their, uh, their previous... Um, Previous results, uh, they won 3-1 against Vancouver Whitecaps in christening their stadium. Uh, they won 3-1, and so uh, that might, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, really embolden them and think that, you know, they uh, want to come into a, you know, the Benz and attack. Please do that. <laughs> please, please, please do that. Yeah. For the love of God, please do that. <laughs> I beg of you, DC. I beseech you yeah. to just try to be like, right. we can attack them. Because I'll actually be very happy more than likely Absolutely. after the game. Yeah, I, I really hope they do. Um, but of course, yeah, they sit at the bottom of the East in 11th place. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think they're also maybe due for some results. I think as well. Especially but you have with... to look at their schedule, though. There, this True. is another thing. I, yeah. I commented last week about how I think MLS's scheduling is stupid. Um, if you want to look at how stupid MLS's scheduling is, take a look at DC United's. They played one home game, and I believe their first 17 matches this season. It wasn't even a home game. It was at some random sports complex in Maryland. The rest of them were all road games up until this past weekend. That is stupid. Mighty part well, of that is their own fault for not staying in RFK until their field was done. It's true. But exactly. at the same time, really MLS? You couldn't have, you know, done a little bit to work with them more, but... Well, it could have been a choice by them, uh, you know, I think uh, what was smart about us last year in that we played some games at Bobby Dodd and then moved into Mercedes-Benz uh, for the majority of the games. Yeah, there's a little bit of, uh, I think, some, some street smarts a little bit in that. Uh, you don't want your team to just be completely, you know, if they're not a good road team, they're hung out to dry for the yeah. entire season pretty much uh, up until now. That's just, yeah. I think their points total will improve. I mean, that's really tough to do. Yeah. And as you know, like MLS is not a league where teams pick up a lot of points on the road. Yeah. I think with, you know, again, almost all, the rest of their games, the exception to this one, I think almost all of them, if not all of them, are going to be at home at their new field, uh, Audi Field. So I think they're going to pick up some points totals. I don't think they'll be bottom of the East come the end of the season. I think that could be occupied by some other team that people don't really like around here. Sure. But, you know, they still are going to offer a challenge. And if last week showed anything, you can't discount a team at the bottom of the table. Right. And getting into their statistical leaders, Yamil Assad, our, our old friend Yamil Assad, uh, leads their team with eight goals along with Darren Maddox, their, their striker, uh, with eight goals as well. Uh, Luciano Acosta leads their team with seven assists. I really and, don't like that guy. Yeah, that, that dude, that little, it, he's almost like uh, their little P, I guess, or something. Like, he's, he's so tiny, and he, he always, scored just yeah. great goals against United at Bobby Dodd last Very year, annoying. and it was just yeah. really frustrating. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, Wayne Rooney got his uh, first assist for DC United already in this uh, previous game, uh, coming on late as a sub. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they're gonna be formidable. And so, you know, we have our work cut out for us defensively, but uh, 
that leads us to our formation. I mean, would anything change for you? I mean, I thought I was really surprised to see McCann starting this past weekend. I thought Ambrose would continue on, but yeah. after his first half performance against Philly, I guess maybe on that account, it's not shocking to see McCann come back into the side to just get him playing again. Back. Sure. I think that for me, I think McCann plays again this weekend just because I think DC will try to be a little bit more aggressive. They have players that can hurt Atlanta United. Mm -hmm. History has shown DC plays well against Atlanta United. I don't yeah. know why, but they do. Assad will be a danger man. Yeah. Acosta will be a danger man. Maddox will be, I think Rooney will start. They have attacking players who can do some damage. So I think it would be smart to have McCann in the side to give you a little bit more, you know, defensive stability because I think DC United can be got at, especially if they are attacking. You don't need Ambrose to be overlapping that quickly in the first half. I'd also like to think that Escobar needs to be a little bit more conservative with some of the runs he makes because DC will be looking for that counter with the players they have. You know Yamil can do it. So. I think McCann starts for me on the left. Aside from yep. that, I, I think it's going to be pretty much the exact same 11 that we yep. saw this, this past Sunday against uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, while I understand what you're saying and I, I agree to an extent, I think uh, we, we kind of missed a little bit of that, that dynamic of being able to combo play on the left this past match. I mean, basically, uh, you know, Miguel Miron and Barco, they had to really create more and not really combined with anybody. Um, so I think it really, it, it behooves us to have somebody that can, uh, you know, get up and down the flanks uh, quicker than uh, McCann. And so I think Ambrose comes in, but other than that, uh, not much changes. So uh, that leads us into our predictions for this match. Um, yeah, man, what do you think, dude? I am incredibly torn right now. Um, on one hand, you look at Atlanta's record this year coming off matches in which they've dropped points. They've won eight of those games, and I believe they've drawn one, and that's it when they come off, you know, frustrating yep. results. So on that account, I should be very, very positive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I was very, very negative coming away from that game against Seattle. I was really disappointed. I thought that they were there to be had, even though they are defensively sound. I thought Atlanta should have won that game. Um, so, I, I agree with you. Though. I think DC, emboldened by their win last week, I think they will park the bus, but I think they'll try to play the game more than what we saw from Seattle. Mm -hmm. I think their attacking players are better than what we saw from Seattle. Yep. So I think that they'll take those opportunities to try to get at Atlanta United. If Atlanta United can get the first goal, mm -hmm. if Atlanta United can get yep. one, if they, I, I think Atlanta United in this game, mm -hmm. they haven't been aggressive enough coming out of the blocks, yep. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. They have to come out and try to hammer this DC team early. Yep. If they can get a goal early, mm -hmm. go a goal up, I think that they can beat this team by multiple goals. That being said, I think DC is really good offensively, and I don't think Atlanta United, again, has necessarily been great at home. I'm I'm gonna go for a two-two draw. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think this is might this might be the first time that we actually agree. I think uh, yeah, it's gonna be a two-two draw as well. Uh, there are goals to be had, but I think once. Uh, you know, it depends on who scores first, I think. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, the way it's been going lately, I think DC probably scores first, uh, and then we chase the game, and, you know, it just, it's just a little bit back and forth, and ultimately, we might come away not as happy as we want to be again and against another bottom dweller. But that's it. That's our uh, that's our preview of the, uh, the DC United match, and that gets us to our question of the day yeah and to keep it you know kind of in the same vein of not exactly depressing but let's be honest our form's not great our question of the day is going to be if the season was to end today and we we're going to go into the postseason how would you feel about atlanta and his chances personally for me i don't have as his favorites to win the mls cup anymore i'm not convinced of our form at home and i would rather be playing that mls cup final away and not at the bins because I think that if we play away from home right now, teams try to play us, and maybe we can make a result there. But again, if the season was to end today and the playoffs were to start, how far do you think Atlanta would go, and how do you think they would do? Get down in the comments and let us know what you think. But guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't, smash a like for us, and share this video because it really does help us a lot. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hey!